Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Roger asked me to speak briefly. Uh, on the I asked everybody to speak briefly, but it's done, done no good. I, mean. <laughs> so I don't have to feel obliged to speak briefly. Uh, on the subject of if not God, then what? And he asked me specifically to talk about what being in this profession that I'm in um, and staring, as he put it, staring immensity and eternity in the face every day does for one's view of life and spirituality. I said that? You did. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. And then he asked me to do the Carl Sagan thing and speak about awe and wonder. So uh, I'm going to start by saying that I am in awe of how wonderful it is to be among all of you today uh, and to be among the illustrious speakers who are on the agenda. Uh, thank you, Roger, for the invitation. Okay. Uh, it is an honor. And I'm going to need a... Here we go. And um, I think that if anyone... Uh, has got a replacement for God that is answering the question, if not God, then what? I think that scientists do. So I'm going to disagree, I think, strongly with what we heard uh, Steve Weinberg say. Um, and that's why this meeting has been so interesting, because people come to it with different points of view. I just want to say, though, that it's remarkable to me that in all these years, uh, the years during which Bertrand Russell was alive and since he's died, no one has figured out that there are probably a billion China teapots in orbit around the sun. They just all happen to be affixed to the Earth, but they're still orbiting the sun. So, <laughs> so somebody should take that statement and just stick an Alpha Centauri in there and take out the sun, because the way it's stated, it's incorrect. Um, anyway, before, before one can think about replacing God, one has to find out or ask the question what role God plays. Uh, that is, why do people need God and why do people need religion? And in my mind, they are two very, very different things. Uh, they're two different uh, qu distinct questions because the God concept and the religion and religion are related, but they're not the same. Uh, and, and I'm going to have to be taking a drink of water here at some point. Um, and there are, of course, lots of different, con well, many different concepts of God. And the one that's most relevant to what I'm going to say is the conceptual device that people employ to, f to feel connected to something grander and something greater than they are. This is the idea. God is uh, omnipotent and omniscient and immortal, and he made me in his image and likeness. Um, and then through that connection to this great uh, uh, being in the sky that I look like and I'm, you know, I was made by, uh, through that connection to find meaning and purpose in their lives, and ultimately to find reason to believe that they too will be immortal. And I believe that we've skirted around an issue that I think is just absolutely core to everything, this conflict of science and religion, and that is that people fear death, okay? We have a tremendous fear of death and the uncertainty of what lies after death. And I think it's a strong factor in all of this, and I'm gonna say more about that later. Um, but I think that the same spiritual fulfillment that people find in religion uh, can be found in science. This is counter to what Steve Weinberg said. Uh, because to me, at the heart of every scientific uh, inquiry is a deep spiritual quest, and that is a quest to know and a quest to feel a connection to the natural world by comprehending it and you know, by coming to know, if you will, the mind of God. Uh, and this is certainly what drove me to be a scientist and to be an astronomer, my own personal quest began when I was a young teenager and I actually went through a period of time, it only lasted a few months, but I went through a period of time where I very, very earnestly tried to practice the religion that I was born into, which was Catholicism, um, and that didn't, that didn't do it for me. It just wasn't gratifying enough and I was all engaged in asking the questions, the big questions of wonder. What are we doing here? And, uh, what is the purpose of us being here? Why am I personally, individually here? Uh, and to find out, I turned to the study of astronomy. And it seemed to me if there were going to be any answers to be found um, at all, they were going to be found in the facts uh, and in understanding the greater theater within which uh, human life has unfolded. And I was right about that. Uh, being a scientist and staring immensity and eternity in the face every day is about as meaningful, I think, and grand and awe-inspiring as it gets, uh, we, especially we astronomers, confront the big questions of wonder every day and the answers to these questions in the aggregate 
have produced, and this is with absolutely no hype, have produced the greatest story that's ever been told, and there isn't a religion, I think, that can offer anything better. And as Jules Verne said, reality provides us with facts so romantic that imagination itself could add nothing to them. And I say amen to that. So we have a story that has been built up um, through scientific investigation of you know, the development of the universe, of the seemingly miraculous conversion of mere energy to matter. I mean, what seems more miraculous than that? Of the development over billions of years, uh, the development of fundamental particles to DNA, of the development of microbes to humans, and of the uh, singularity of the Big Bang ultimately creating the unimaginable vastness that we have all around us in the universe. And this is a story with drama, with spectacle, with magnificence, and so on. And so I'm going to take you through just a few scenes from this movie. Uh, you've seen them many times before, but I just thought it, it um, stood repeating. And besides, I was tasked with inspiring you with awe and wonder, and so that's what I'm going to do. Um, and so this is our Earth. As you know, we're going to step back and we're going to go uh, not quite to the Big Bang. I couldn't find a graphic for the Big Bang, but you all know in the scientific story we all began with the Big Bang. But this is the Hubble Deep Field. It is um, the deepest picture that has ever, was ever created. I think that's still true. Uh, you can see this whole potpourri of, uh, of objects. Everything in here is a galaxy. Uh, and we see galaxies here that developed uh, 800 uh, million, li uh, million years after the Big Bang. So, so we're looking back something like uh, 13 billion uh, light years ago and also 13 billion light years away. You all know you look backwards, you look out into the universe, and uh, the farther out you go, the farther backwards in time you go. And then there are galaxies that look kind of normal in, uh, in this image. There are spirals, there are ellipticals, and so on. And these are the, the younger galaxies here. They're closer to us. Um, so right away we see that there are, there are galaxies, there have been galaxies inhabiting the universe for billions of years. This is just a particular group of galaxies. They are dynamically connected. They are uh, involved in this ballet on, which transpires on time scales of hundreds of millions of years. Uh, and they act gravitationally the way they do because the universe was not completely uniform after the Big Bang. There were seeds of you know, concentrations of heavier than, uh, uh, denser than average uh, places in both radiation and then ultimately in matter. And these coalesced under the force of gravity to give us uh, groups of galaxies, and then those broke off to be galaxies, and then the galaxies themselves, as you know, broke off to be, I mean, uh, condensed out to be stars. Um, this is uh, the beautiful Sombrero Galaxy, 28 million light years from Earth, about uh, 50,000 light years across. Um, this disk spiral, uh, this here is the dust uh, and gas, but you're seeing here the dust that has settled down into the, uh, the disk of the galaxy. Here is uh, a barred galaxy. Not all galaxies are the same. <clears throat> They're not shaped the same. This is a beautiful barred spiral. Uh, and then this is just one of the most beautiful, high, very, a lot of detail in this whirlpool galaxy. And you can see the red regions are the star forming regions when uh, in the rotation of matter around the center of the galaxy, uh, large molecular clouds are sent through a region uh, these spiral arms, uh, which are actual dynamical entities, they themselves rotate around the galaxy with a different speed. Um, when these large molecular clouds pass through this region, they are compressed, uh, and out pop on the other side, out pop uh, a lot of uh, blue stars. You can see that here, too. Um, you can see blue stars kind of on the outside of these, uh, these spiral arms. Um, and then we find galaxies that are in the process of merging. There's galactic cannibalism going on. This is how galaxies uh, grow in size. And this is this beautiful merger we're viewing here. Um, and anyway, so you can see that we are, we've learned quite a lot just by looking out into the universe. We know that there are lots of other galaxies. Ours is not the only one. When we look inside our own galaxy, so we're looking at things that are tens or, well, tens of thousands of light years away, we find lots of regions where stars are being born. This here is the Orion Nebula. It's the middle star in the sword of Orion. And this 
Here, not too far away, is the Horsehead Nebula. These are regions where stars are being born. Uh, and this, of course, is the famous Eagle Nebula that Neil, uh, Reverend Neil, um, referred to. <laughs> Really, Reverend, uh, Neil is going to be our first minister of our Church of Scientists. <laughs> He's got what it takes. Anyway, um, here are these little cocoons uh, that are illuminated, in fact, by stars, bright stars out of the picture above. They illuminate this, these dense uh, clouds of uh, molecular hydrogen and also dust, and they actually evaporate. The ultraviolet light evaporates the material leaving these little cocoons, actually they're called eggs, and inside each of these is an embryonic star, and the size of these little cocoons is about the size of our solar system. So obviously, everywhere we look, we find exactly what we find here around us. There is nothing extraordinary uh, in seeing, um, in, in anything that we have around us, and here's just a close-up of the, uh, that region that I pointed out to you. Uh, and then finally, looking only 32 light years away. This is actually, uh, there's a red dwarf star here, and you can see once the light of the star is blocked out, you could see that this star is enveloped with a disk. This is a disk of dust and debris. Uh, it's something across uh, like four or five times the classical limit of our solar system that is out to about the orbit of Neptune. Of course, we have the Kuiper belt, and that goes out far. So it's not, it's about the size of our solar system or a little bit larger if you consider our Kuiper belt. Uh, but, but now we find disks around other stars, they're common. We're finding planets around other stars. We have something, I think I lose count because we're discovering so many of them. I don't remember how many there are now, but I think when last I read about this, we had something like 200 planets around other stars. We haven't yet found any terrestrial-like planets, small planets, because they're very difficult to see. But I think with time, it's inevitable. All we need is for the astronomical instrumentation to get uh, capable enough for us to see those uh, evidence of those very small planets around other stars. But planets themselves are common. So 